the, these are poets. Two of them are very, very old friends. I won't say how old because it'll make me feel old. Um, right now I feel so young. Um, and the other two are poets I'm just meeting, and, uh, and, but I know all their work, and I'm a big admirer of, of all of their work. And, um, uh, you know, my appointment here was really, you know, as the curator of the uh, Cone series of concerts, which I do. Some of you may know me from that. But, um, and we do have wonderful concerts coming up. Uh, one is in November uh, with the Borromeo Quartet and sp some special guests, including me. I guess I'm a special guest at my own concert. And the, the second one is Mallet Madness with three wonderful marimba players, one playing contemporary music, one playing um, jazz, and one playing African xylophone. Um, so I hope you can make either of those or both, you know. Um, but in any case, tonight we have uh, these, these wonderful poets coming to read. We, uh, I had approached um, the director, Peter Goddard, about starting a writer series last year, which we launched. And we had two writers, Steve Bodo from The Daily Show, and um, uh, who's the head writer for The Daily Show. And, uh, um, and, and, and then we had Alex and Vincent Katz talking about their work as, um, as artists and poet in collaboration. And so now we have four poets coming to read to us tonight, and um, and they're going to and and one thing that I just I think that is part of the reason that I was so attracted to all of their work is just that they're also musical in their in their work, and um, uh, so that's very exciting. And I'm I'm really glad that we have are having other artists come in besides musicians here because I think it just makes everything very rich. Um, so without hesitation, I want to introduce the moderator of tonight's uh, readings, because uh, hopefully it will be a reading and then discussion, so we're going to have a little talk afterwards. Um, and uh, that is Tracy K. Smith, and um, she is a professor um, here at, in Princeton, but at the Lewis Center, um, and uh, she is uh, born in Massachusetts, but grew up in San Francisco. Or San Francisco, is that right? Kind of California, let's just say on the West Coast. Um, and lives in Brooklyn now. And uh, her poems have appeared uh, in a number of many, many, many journals, uh, including The New Yorker and Callaloo and Boulevard. And, um, and it, she has a BA from Harvard, MFA from Creative Writing uh, from Columbia, and was a Wallace Stegner Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University, which is a very big honor. Uh, and also taught, uh, and, and has been teaching uh, in Princeton um, for the past few years. Uh, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I was so struck by all the musical references, especially to Brazilian slash Portuguese, like mostly coming from Brazil, uh, and this, the, the, the concept of saudades that's in her poem. She has two wonderful books, The Body's Questions and Duende. Uh, and Duende is fairly recent, but it's a couple years old. Right, so so we're gonna hopefully you know hear something from one of those two books, uh, but in any case, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Tracy K. Smith, and she'll introduce the other poets to you and uh, enjoy. Good afternoon. I'm going to take advantage of the podium in case some of the poets would choose to read here. Um, and I will introduce all three of them now so that I won't be getting up and down. And I will introduce them in the reverse order that they'll be reading in. So I'll start with Thomas Sayers Ellis. Thomas is a poet, photographer, and assistant professor of creative writing at Sarah Lawrence College. He's also a core faculty member of the Leslie University Low Residency MFA program. His first full-length collection, The Maverick Room, won the John C. Zakaris First Book Award from Plowshares Magazine. That book takes as its subject the social, geographical, and historical neighborhoods of Washington, D.C., bringing different tones of voice to bear on the various quadrants of the city. His most recent collection, Skin, Ink, Identity, Repair Poems, moves by way of lyric poems and Ellis's own photography through the terrain of race in America, laying out along the way an argument for, quote, poetic wholeness. He's the author of a chat book, The Genuine Negro Hero, and the Chaplet Song, song On. 
In 1988, uh, Ellis co-founded the now legendary Darkroom Collective in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and that was an organization that celebrated and gave greater visibility to emerging and established writers of color with a reading series that um, every other Sunday for many years um, brought the uh, voices of older and younger poets together for um, a pretty wide audience. He's received fellowships and grants from the Fine Arts Work Center, the Ohio Arts Council, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, Yaddo, and the McDowell Colony and elsewhere. Um, Our second reader is Suji Kwok Kim, and her first book, Notes from the Divided Country, won the Addison Metcalf Award from the Academy of, um, of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Walt Whitman Award from the Academy of American Poets, the Bay Area Book Reviewers Award, and it was a finalist for the Griffin Prize. Poems from her second book, In Progress, Disorient, have appeared or are forthcoming in a number of publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the LA Times, and elsewhere. Her poems have been reprinted in 24 anthologies, translated into Russian, Spanish, Italian, German, Korean, Japanese, Arabic, and Bengali. She is editing two anthologies of Asian and Asian American poetry um, and co-translating with the author a book by the Korean poet Hwang Tung Yu. Uh, Choral settings of Kim's work, composed by Mayako Kubo for the Tokyo Philharmonic Chorus, premiered at Pablo Casals Hall in Tokyo in 2007. Vocal settings of her work, composed by Jerome Blaise for voice and chamber ensemble, premiered in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and were recorded by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. A new composition for violin, chorus, and orchestra based on her work by Vienna-based composer Mark Gray will be performed by the LA Philharmonic. She and Gray are also collaborating on an opera and Private Property, a multimedia play that she wrote, was showcased at Playwrights Horizons in New York City, produced at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe and featured on the BBC. Currently, she teaches in the MFA program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And Wendy S. Walters, who will actually be our first reader, is the author of Longer I Wait, More You Love Me, and a chat book, Birds of Los Angeles. Her poetry has been recognized with residency fellowships from Breadloaf, McDowell, Cave Conum, and Yaddo. At present, Walters is an assistant professor of poetry in the Department of Literary Studies at the Eugene Lang College of the New New School University in New York City. Walters' lyric work with composer Derek Brumell has been performed widely at venues ranging from Carnegie Hall and Joe's Pub in New York City to the Louisiana Museum for Modern Kunst in Denmark. In 2008, along with Bermel, she was commissioned by the Pittsburgh Symphony and Mendelssohn Choir to write the libretto for The Good Life, an oratorio celebrating the first 250 years of Pittsburgh's history. Walters and Bermel were also artists in residence with the Pittsburgh Symphony, teaching advanced students from the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University in lyrical techniques. In addition to works for large ensembles and orchestras, they've written dozens of art songs. They are completing a musical called Golden Motors, which was commissioned by the Mary Flogler Carey Charitable Trust. Um, So just based on the variety of different genres and art forms that these three poets are are working, and I'm excited about the conversation um, that'll happen after the reading, where you'll also have time for questions. But let's welcome Wendy S. Walters. Okay, I wasn't really sure where to go. and um, I'm also not sure whether or not to read an old piece or a new piece. Um, they're too long. They're too long, so you must choose. Um, I think um, maybe what I'll do is I'll read... Um, I think I'll read a new piece. Um, so uh, this this piece is, uh, uh, I guess, a, a, 
It's a single uh, long piece written in fragments. It's called Norway. Um, when I and whoever else was left a black America finally got out of there, we met up in Norway. The war had taken years off our memory of each other. We had not integrated enough technology into our rituals of self-absorption to say for certain when we completely lost sight of the future. We had, uh, no unusual, uh, we had no unnatural access to the past, and what little we knew about our home was found only in the library. Most of us arrived before the 4th of July, just in time for the eve of St. Hans, the long white nights of midsummer. We did not know then how many children would be born the following March but our passion did not surprise the Norwegians who were already used to a fecund spring season. The ambassadors Voltemand and Cornelius greeted us with the customary gentleness we came to expect. Single black women were encouraged to sleep with seven kinds of wildflowers pressed under their pillow in order to help them dream of the right man to marry if they preferred a man. The custom, though regional, seemed to make sense to us in an oddly personal way, though our traditions had been forged thousands of miles from here in a climate too humid to tolerate sleep during summer. Illegal immigrants of the underclass who had been cast out of Norway to make room for us had been targeted by the government for stealing education. One euphemism we used for them was excess or over sky tende, a word we could not pronounce easily. We called them sky tenders instead, which made them sound a bit like oppressors during slavery. This helped us to think we were better than them, as we claimed their neighborhoods for our neighborhoods. Courses in Norwegian were offered by the Bergen Offlington Bibliothek, which welcomed us with a tour of the building. As the library had been built atop, a former site, uh, built atop the site of a former brewery, we did not see any contradiction between studying language and enjoying a pilsner or two. Having little experience navigating fjords, we traded our skills in mathematics for lessons on how to sail the inlets through fog and silence. We brushed up on alienation and deadpan too. Those of us who could not speak Norwegian, Russian, or Greek took jobs in tourist markets in Bergen. Those fluent in Swedish experienced the occasional disappointment of being mistaken for African. Some Africans wanted nothing to do with us after our exile from, from a second continent. We took over running the Norwegian state railways. Three newspapers reported independently that the black American had retained few competencies during the latest migration. All season, we delayed trains for tourists who planned to catch the last trip out of town. Our night rides received top ratings in the Lonely Planet Travel Guide and one other tour book for English speakers in Scandinavia. After two seasons of integration, it became harder to tell who we belonged to and who belonged to us. When the train arrived at the waterfall before reaching Flam, a man stood naked facing the water, his back facing all those who just arrived. When we called out to him, our tongues stung from salt in the air. Was he one or the other? When we called out to him, he did not turn, but that may not have been his answer. After the laws to promote citizenship were revoked following hysteria about the murder of several young skinheads, another migration commenced in the general direction of Iceland, though not necessarily that far. It turned out that only a few of the murdered men were neo-Nazis, but because the purported assassin was suspected to be Negro, we were condemned as a group this is not a problem we emphasized even where our overcrowding in neighborhoods seemed to incite the most fear. Trains running at high speeds often skipped a stop or two. 
Which ones they missed, though not easy to predict, were noted on the board as Harlem, St. Louis, Detroit, for reasons we would eventually understand as gestures of friendship. Of course, there would have been no need to go to Norway if we had anywhere else to go. It wasn't fair that the land given to us belonged to someone else, but an international urgency to make recompense for egregious misdeeds perpetrated over centuries won over the standing values. The only thing to do is reckon with the present because the past bears costs that can never be added up. More brutality than can ever be accounted for. More stupidity than can ever be forgotten. More cruelty than can ever be enjoyed. When it rained through the northern summer, we ate bacalao at the tourist cafes and dreamed of Georgia, Jamaica, and Brazil. We listened to stories about how cold it felt before the oil was found and how the churches were the center of all hope, one island town after another. We confessed how quietly we had been chased out of the worst cities in America and how we were glad to be free of the hope it could be any way else. About a year after we first arrived, the statue of Edward Grieg in the Festplassen in front of the Reichsstefflon in the Bergen was stolen. A note left in its place said, yeah, we took it. He's ours now. The police searched the Fillingsdalen neighborhood door to door, but there was no sign of Grieg's statue. The conservatory committed to performing one of his sonatas each week until it was recovered. After a year, the students grew frustrated with the, lack, with the lack of electronic instruments and became less willing to participate in the concerts. Grieg is dead, one young woman shouted before she was expelled from the concert hall. Despite the turmoil, we had become the most, pop, most regular attendees at the free concerts, though most of us preferred his compositions from Pierre Gint and after. A few of us were swimming in a mountain lake on the top of Ulriken, just outside of Bergen. It had taken the whole day to hike this far. Below, the city looked big enough to welcome all travelers. This late in the summer, most of the ice had melted, and as we entered the water, tiny frogs swam all around us. It's really wonderful to be here with, um, to be hosted by Derek, who's a very old friend, and to meet these wonderful <laughs> poets again. Um, second time I'm reading with Thomas. Um, I'm going to read a mixture of old and new work. Um, Tracy had mentioned the question of other genres and other art forms, which I think we're going to be discussing afterwards probably a little bit. Um, and I started out as a playwright um, before I was a poet. And um, so this first poem is called Monologue for an Onion. And you can imagine the onion is speaking. Monologue for an Onion. I don't mean to make you cry. I mean nothing, but this has not kept you from peeling away my body, layer by layer. The tears clouding your eyes as the table fills with husks, cut flesh, all the debris of pursuit. Poor deluded human, you seek my heart. Hunt all you want. Beneath each skin of mine lies another skin. I am pure onion, pure union of outside and in, surface and secret core. Look at you, chopping and weeping, idiot. Is this the way you go through life? Your mind a stopless knife? driven by your fantasy of truth, of lasting union, slashing away skin after skin from things, ruin and tears your only signs of progress? Enough is enough. You must not grieve that the world is glimpsed through veils. How else can it be seen? How will you rip away the veil of the eye, the veil that you are, 
You who want to grasp the heart of things, hungry to know where meaning lies. Taste what you hold in your hands, onion juice, yellow peels, my stinging shreds. You are the one in pieces. Whatever you meant to love, in meaning to, you changed yourself. You are not who you are. Your soul cut moment to moment by a blade of fresh desire, the ground sown with abandoned skins. And at your inmost circle, what? A core that is not one. Poor fool. You are divided at the heart, lost in its maze of chambers, blood, and love. A heart that will one day beat you to death. Um, the three of us have actually uh, had babies recently, I guess. I don't know how long ago, Tracy, in your case. 11 months. 11 months. So 13 months, 11 months, and six months for me. Um, and so I'm going to read an older poem, um, actually from the baby's perspective, imagining what it was like being born. Um, and it's, it's very odd revisiting this older work now that um, we're <laughs> you know, from the other side. And this, this one is called Generation. Zero. Once I was nothing. Once we were one. One. In the unborn world, we heard the years hurtling past, whirring like gears in a giant factory, time, time, time. Two. We heard human breathing, thoughts coming and going like bamboo leaves hissing in wind. Doubts swarming like reconnaissance planes over forests of sleep. We heard words murmured in love. Three. We felt naked bodies climb each other, cleaving, cleaving, as if they could ride each other to a country that can't be named. We felt bed springs creak, felt the rough sailcloth of sheets dampen, felt wet skin hold them together and apart. What borders did they cross? What more did they want? Bittersweet, the sweat we tasted, the swollen lips we touched, the chafe of separate loins. Bittersweet, the wine of one flesh, they drank and drank. Four. They called us over oceans of dream salt, their voices moving over the face of the waters like searchlights from a guard tower. We hid and refused to come out. Their cries followed like police dogs snarling from a leash. We ran through benzene rain, flew through clouds of jet fuel. We swam through hydrogen spume, scudded among stars numberless as sands. We didn't want to be born, we didn't want. Blindly, their hands groped for us, like dragnets trawling for corpses. Blindly, their hands hauled me like grappling hooks from the waves, the foaming scalps of ghost children laughing, seaweed hair dripping, the driftwood of other children who might have been. Out of chromosomes and dust, cells of hope, cells of history, out of refugees running from mortar shells, immigrants driving to power plants in Jersey. Out of meadow sweet and oil, the chaff of unlived lives blowing endlessly. Out of wishes known and unknown, they reeled me in. Five. I entered the labyrinth of mother's body. I wandered through nerve forests branching in every direction, towering trees fired by feeling, crackling and smoldering. I rode through vein rivers. I splashed in lymph creeks between islands of glands. I leapt rib to rib, rung to rung on the spine. I swung from the ropes of entrails. I clambered over tectonic plates of the skull, scrambling not to fall down the chasms between, mine mountains where I could see no bottom. I peered through sockets at the brain, brewing in cliffs of bone like a gigantic volcano with its magma of memories, magma of tomorrows. I could have played there forever, watching, wondering at the vast expanses inside, wondering at the great chambers in the heart. 
What machine made me move into the womb cave, made me a grave of flesh, now the engine of beginning driving forwards, cells dividing, cells dividing. Now neurons sizzling, dendrites buzzing. Now arteries tunneling tissue like tubes hooked to an IV. Now organ pump, organs pumping, hammers of hunger and thirst pounding. Now sinews cleaving, tendons lashing meat to bone. Meanwhile, my skeleton welding, scalp cementing like mortar. Meanwhile, my face soldered on, hardening like a mask of molten steel. Meanwhile, my blood churning like a furnace of wanting. Meanwhile, my heart ticking like a bomb, is, was, is, was. Then cold metal tongs clamped my forehead and temples. Then forceps plucked me from mother's body like fruit torn from a tree. Then I heard a cry of pain, mine, not mine. Then a scalpel's snip snip against the umbilical cord like razors scraping a leather strop. Soon I felt sticky with blood and matted fur, surgical lights blinding. Soon I felt tears burning my skin. Why are you crying? Why am I? I didn't know who or what I was, only that I was. Each question answered by the echo of my voice alone. I, I, I. And this next poem is actually now from the other perspective. <laughs> um, and this one is called Sonogram Song. Is this too close or is, this, is it fine, the sound? Okay, great, thanks. Sonogram song. Out of albumin and blood, out of amniotic brine, placental sea swell, trough, spume, foam. You came to us infinitely far, little traveler, from the other world. Driftwood bone, rib rigging, the ship of you scudding wave after wave of, white, of what might never have been. Memory, stay faithful to this moment that will never return. May I never forget when we first saw you there on the other side, still fish-gilled, still water-lunged, your seaweed hair and seahorse spine floating in the sonogram screen, skull keel and heel socketed to pelvic cradle, fists in sleep twitch, moth breath, quicksilver, not yet alive, but not, not, you who were and were not, your liquid skeleton ghost chalked in black and white grain, a thunder of blood beats sutured in green jags on the ultrasound, ultrasound machine, like hoof beats riding from eternity to time, kicking bone creel and womb wall while we waited, never to waken in that world again, the world without the shadow of your death. And may I never forget when we first saw you in your afterlife, which was life. Little pilgrim, little traveler from tomorrow, wet otter pelt and swan down crowning, skull called in blood and mucus mud, you who might not have lived, who might never have been born like all the others. Tiny slippery boy, frog legged, fists curled, eyes soldered shut, black birth cord rooting you from one world to the next, while we wondered at every pock and crook of your soft skull, every clotted hair seal slick on your blue scalp, every pore, every nail, every inch of skin, every breath suck and swallow, with so much joy that joy is not the word. How am I doing for time? One more? Okay. Um, this last poem is uh, set in North Korea, where my grandparents on my father's side are still trapped, actually. Um, and one of the perhaps few things that uh, George W. Bush um, said that was absolutely accurate is that he called Kim Jong-il a loathsome pygmy. <laughs> um, so this is set in Pyongyang, and um, the rest is self-explanatory. Hotel Utopia. Who minds the minders? To watch them watch you, watch them watch each other watching you, as you walk along the Dedong River through the Simulacra city, 
past the Jucha Tower, the Mangyongde Revolutionary School, past the Victoria's Fatherland Liberation War Museum and the mausoleum of Kim Il-sung, watching the soldiers play soldiers, factory workers play factory workers, everyone wearing that looked at look, the passengers riding one stop on the Soviet era metro, exiting, walking back to the first station, re-entering, riding to the same stop again, over and over, like Sisyphus on a subway in hell. Again and again, the guards, the grating turnstiles, the creaking escalators, the socialist realist ceiling mosaics, the rusting trains, the exit that is not an exit. Giant photos of the great leader hang on every wall, staring at me like a shorter, fatter Mao. The dictator's dead father is still eternal president, the only corpse holding executive office in the world. Oh, why should the sight of cheerful factory workers, smiling peasants, and tap-dancing schoolchildren make you melancholy? It could drive you mad. You could die of lying and being lied to, die of boredom, die of strangeness. This is the other life I might have lived, the fate I escaped, the not I in the I, the never in the now. Two. The silence is never silent in this country. I can hear the grit, the grains, splinters of different silences within the silence, hear the hiss of sizzling wires, the crackling of malfunctioning microphones, feel the prick of scalp hair, neck nerves prickled by the click of a surveillance camera. I can hear the dream drum, the solitude inside my, mother, my minder's mind, the windy spaces, within, the view without a room. Where has he gone? I don't know if he believes what he says or pretends to because he must, as I must pretend to believe he believes what he says. I can taste the metallic tin can words he speaks, hear the unspoken words buzzing, swarming like flies to shit. The sound of ass covering, stomach turning, skin crawling, taste the bile, spit, rage at wasting one's life. The minutes ticking, hours whirring, the years smeared and sticky with waiting for the revolution to finish. Deafening, the sound of my eyeballs rolling back into my skull. Sickening, the smell of not saying what you feel, not meaning what you say. The smell of a man lying to your face to save his own skin. I know it, I know it well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor. It's family. And um, I'm pregnant, too. <laughs> no, but um, I'm going to fight through a scratchy throat and read from a new book. Poems about skin, race, food, language, noise. I often said, um, I guess created problems for myself to work through the composition of the, 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 the text. And it's just a simp simply a poem where I was just tied of the first person one night and trying to figure out a way to make progression some other way. This is called or, which happens to be my favorite conjunction. Or. Or Oreo. Or worse. Or ordinary. Or your choice of category or color or any color other than colored or colored only or of color or other or theory or discourse or oral territory or Oregon or Georgia or Florida Zora or opportunity or born poor or corporate, or more, or a noir Orpheus, or Sangor, or diaspora, or a horrendous and tore up journey, or 
performance or allegories, armor of ignorant comfort or worship or reform or a so chorus or electoral corruption or important ports of Yoruba or worry or neighbor or fear of of terror or border or all organized minorities. So I want to live in this building. Um, I'm a big, 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 big super fan of everything mid-century, including uh, I have a poem where I make fun of, hello, make fun of um, even the cadence and syntax of the old poetic line, you know, the, uh, the let us go then you and I. Evening is spread out, which is actually the first poem text I loved. But here's a poem that has a embedded George Nelson object in it, and George Nelson being the design. It's a poem about time, and it's called The Obama Hour. I gotta find it though, because it's a new book. Here we go. Finally, one of us is properly positioned to run. By us, I mean black. By position, I mean white. By run, I mean race. And it's varied speeds of darkness, the way silver writes faster than revolution, and the lit and darkening skin of the sky. The triumphant exasperation, though, belongs to the word finally, with its slanted F signifying relief. Uh, about time, up from the reservoir of coated size, we make to mask time, colored people's time, our well-known resistance to the Romanized face of the clock, to discuss running, running the country, a black man running, an African running America, you must discuss race, including the difficult qualifying times between the theft of our arrival and all hate crimes, race as gift, as campaign donation, and gifts matter it's racist to erase race, because erase means blackness, ethnic cleansing, get rid of the blacks, and worse, to hack off history or any limb at any time, except for purposes of assimilation and modern design in place of the usual halo of numbers orange balls and spindles, lazy, often late for work, our walk, a discourse, shifting like the unemployed shadow of a brother leaning on a corner, but America prefers religion to race, and the clock has disciples, hours, cuckoos, and cock a little -loos. the people go to sleep. And the people wake up to nature, nations, and denominations of not the bedside duet of alarm and digital glow. Thank you. I can't believe I say cuckoos and cockle doodle doos in a poem. I always think that when I get to that, how to bail out. Let's see. Suji read a poem in the voice of an onion. So I got a call from a NPR radio show called um, The Splendid Table. Do you know that show? It's about food. And they called me and asked me to write a food poem. I thought, really? So here's my contribution to that. And 
what um what food do you think I wrote about? Who said onion? No, um, I'm writing about skin. I'm writing about rays. Chitlin's pretty good. You know, I'm pretty bold, but not that bold. <laughs> Plus, it's been some years. <laughs> Anybody else? Chocolate. Oh, that's pretty good. Who said chocolate? Hey, you. Um, no, but that's good, though. <laughs> this poem is called Godzilla's Avocado. <laughs> and um, I love avocados. It has a little girl in it. She's six years old. Her name is Prophet, spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Here we go. Tonight, Prophet is helping Nani make creatures. The term she cooked up for muscles. I am Nani, her fake baby daddy. The one she got her style from, not her soft and buttery bottom lip. That came from mommy. Nani's see things differently. Waffles, brown skin, Lady Liberty making us all healthy, holding up her green flame of asparagus. Prophet's a bean eater, a yummy kingpin critter. Run, edamame, run. The same sun that sets, that rises in orange juice, sets in mac and cheese. From a lumpy russet, swirling in a cosmos of miso, Colors mash into casserole. Kids love kitchens. The sushi chef re-ending monsters with embassy precision. Life's raw rolls ready to unravel the difficult answers we wrap in seaweed. Love is when two people like the same food and the same toys. But war is when lots of people dress up like salads and eat each other. Messy imagination. All meals need metaphors, poems, cutting boards. An art to choke's heart does not pump ketchup. It pumps pesto, oily olive clots of guacamole. Profit is learning to grow things, including time, real time some sense of the vitamins of radiance, the seedling on the windowsill, slow to trust sun. Kids love nature, things smaller than them, like mushrooms cooked into clouds. Radiation, fooling time, rushing food hurts the body. Pesticides are a big deal, poor bees, the microwave hives fear, our silver age of dining. Thank you. Okay. Ellsworth Kelly, I give you the pronoun vowel reparation song. And I grew up with these, so I grew up in love with this. we go. And I can't sing, but A-E-I-O-U Y I-O-U Y Y-I-Y-O-Y-U Y I before you I Before you, before you, before you I A E U O me M E U O me A E U O me O U O U O M O E I E I O I U double O I E I E I O O I O after you O U after Q, U O U O U O I I E I I fix I E I equals E I A E U O I apologize. P 
Thank you. Had I been thinking, I wouldn't have chosen to follow Thomas. <laughs> um, I just wanted to read a few sections from a longish a sequence. I'll read three of those sections. It's a poem called My God, It's Full of Stars. And just to give it a little context in terms of the new work that um, I'm working on or that I've just finished, um, I'm thinking a lot about this about space and the universe as uh, metaphors for American life and um, maybe private conflict. Um, thinking about infinity as a way to think about the afterlife and the before life. Um, so this poem is called My God, It's Full of Stars, which you may recognize as a quote from the novel 2001 A Space Odyssey or the opening line of the um, less majestic film 2010, um, the year we make contact. So um, I'll just read a couple of sections of this poem. Charlton Heston is waiting to be let in. He asked once politely, a second time with force from the diaphragm. The third time he did it like Moses, arms raised high, face an apocryphal white. I open the door, shirt crisp, suit trim. He stoops a little, coming in, then grows tall. He scans the room. He stands until I gesture, then he sits. Birds commence their evening chatter. Someone fires charcoals out below. He'll take a whiskey if I have it, water if I don't. I ask him to start from the beginning, but he only goes halfway back. That was the future once, he says, before the world went upside down. Hero, survivor, God's right-hand man, I know he sees the blank surface of the moon where I see a language built from brick and bone. He sits straight in his seat, takes a long, slow, high thespian breath, then lets it go. For all I know, I was the last true man on this earth. And may I smoke? The voices outside soften, Planes jet past, heading off or back. Someone cries that she does not want to go to bed, footsteps overhead. A fountain in the neighbor's yard babbles to itself, and the night air lifts the sound indoors. It was another time, he says, picking up again. We were pioneers. Will you fight to stay alive here, riding the earth toward God knows where? I think of Atlantis buried under ice, gone one day from sight, the shore from which it rose, now glacial and stark. Our eyes adjust to the dark. In those last scenes of Kubrick's 2001, when Dave is whisked into the center of space, which unfurls in an aurora of orgasmic light, before opening wide, like a jungle orchid for a love-struck bee, then goes liquid, paint in water, and then gauze, wafting out and off, before, finally, the night tide, luminescent and vague, swirls in and on and on. In those last scenes, as he floats above Jupiter's vast canyons and seas, over the lava-strewn plains and mountains packed in ice, that whole time he doesn't blink. In his little ship, blind to what he rides, whisked across the wide screen of unparceled time, who knows what blazes through his mind? Is it still his life he moves through, or does that end at the end of what he can name? On the set, it's shot after shot, till Kubrick is happy. Then the costumes go back on their racks, and the great gleaming set goes black. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold, 
and bright white. He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted, pink. These were the Reagan years, when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked, and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never-ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di. Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came, black, came back blurred, and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jibed. We saw to the edge of all there is, so brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. So I'm going to leave it at that and, and shift into the conversation mode so we can get a little bit... Speaking of other forms, it's like a, we're doing a dance up here, the choreography of the chairs. Um, I want to start with the sometimes tricky subject of identity, um, which comes up a lot in conversations where the writers are not um, visibly of European descent. But I think it's a valuable topic, particularly in considering the, the body of work we have before us today, which stretches the term identity far beyond the self toward the community and the nation and, and perhaps elsewhere. Um, in Suji Kwok Kim's poem, uh, Monologue of an Onion, uh, the speaker says, rip away the veil of I. Um, and later, you are not who you are. In uh, Hotel Utopia, the other life I might have lived is referenced. Um, in Wendy S. Walter's long poem, um, Identity and a Kind of Dystopian, image of the future um, as we extrapolate out from our sense of, of contemporary identity kind of um, goes in lots of different disturbing and exciting directions. Um, and another of her poems that she didn't read from her, her book, the speaker says, inside me are many people. I don't know who they speak for. They talk all the time, um, which is, um, I think, feel a refiguring of Whitman in a way, um, but also a, a way of calling this whole sense of fixed identity into question. And then in Thomas's poems, um, in his collection, we have this uh, concept of identity repair. Um, and at one point, the speaker of a poem encourages identity repair people to be, quote, faders of trick moves, tropodopes, and okie dokes to, and now I'm modifying, lay down, lay our dice down like we love us. In another poem, he writes, I no longer white, write white writing, and I'm not merely in this thing I am in. I am it. So my request for each of you is to start us off by talking a little bit about what you've received or inherited from your predecessors or peers as models for talking about the various layers of self or identity, what you've exhausted, dismissed, and innovated, et cetera, um, and whether or not you think that's a helpful term at all, identity. Um, do you want to start, Wendy? Yeah. <coughs> um, so really <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I'm really interested to hear what everybody else has to say about that. Um, I think that the, uh, there's another poem in my book that's uh, about my father's uh, dealing with a long-term uh, you know, long-term illness that um, is uh, uh, basically not survivable. And a lot of the lines in that poem actually come from him. Um, I didn't read that poem, but um, there is a, a way in which I feel uh, my identity uh, functions almost as radio in the in the po as a poet or um, you know the 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 formation of the lyrical eye in my work tends to be uh, in the process of receiving and broadcasting other voices 
um, that may or may not come in clearly. Um, and sometimes it's a collective voice, like in the piece that I uh, read today. And sometimes it's an individual voice that may be shaped by the frequency with which it's, uh, uh, um, with which it's broadcast. Um, so I guess I, I, I think of the question of identity um, in, in some ways it's spatial for me um, because you never, you're not the same person, I'm, I'm not the same person in this room that I was on the train that I took to get here, that I was in the car that drove me from the train, um, that I was in the train station before I left or the apartment uh, I started this journey from. So um, I'm interested in whatever residue of voice I can gather from any of those spaces. Um, well, what was interesting about the trip to North Korea, for example, was that my life would have been so completely different if I had grown up there, obviously. And it really blew me away because, um, of course, when you go there, they, they take away your passport, your IDs, your cell phone, everything. So actually, all the sort of markers of identity are completely stripped away. And that was very interesting and a little bit scary. Um, but also, what's, what's interesting about that is that they research everybody who comes into their country, no matter for how short a period. And luckily, um, my, first name, my first name legally is Susan. And so... Um, I have a million Google gongers. <laughs> and so um, luckily they didn't know I was a writer because we're actually not allowed into North Korea. And But then that started me thinking when you were saying that um, the multiplicity of identity is for you in some ways spatial. I think that's it, it totally is for me too. I mean, in that country I would have been completely somebody completely different. Um, but also it's temporal I mean if you know we had grown up in a different generation or you know or uh, you know born when our babies were born um, or partially verbal as well I mean the fact that all these people with the same name are leading entirely different lives was really spooky and, and wonderful um, and I think they actually s saved me in some ways they really protected me like I said and that um, it fooled the North Koreans into thinking that I was someone else. <clears throat> Woody Allen has that famous line in um, Annie Hall, and they're about to break up, and they're on the airplane, and he turns to Diane Keaton, and he says, a relationship is like a shark, and um, it has to be in constant motion or it dies, and what we have on our hands here is a dead shark, and they agree to break up. I kind of feel that way about identity, so I'm going to rewrite the, the Allen line. Identity. Um, but as an artist, I also feel like there are things like, I'm trying to add to what they said, because I agree with both of them, and I'm trying to add anotherness to it. Um, as an artist, I feel like tradition and um, whatever the, you know, the, the current trends are and, and the styles and all these other things and whatever the the contemporary container is like, you know, what are people doing? Are they doing the, the short lyric thing, the, the poetry or witness, narrative thing? All these things tug at identity or are, or, or are there for identity to pour, in, pour into but aren't, aren't innocent in the shaping of and the sort of tricking identity or trapping it into something. Um, I had a dream, you know, where e each book in a utopia would be you'd be a totally different person, a totally different style. You know, you do the Miles Davis thing and turn your back on the you. You know, I have a line in my poem in my first book. Called, the poem is called Marcus Garvey Vitamins, and I say I, 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 psych. You know, and I don't, I, I need the I, and, but I, 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 I'm, I fear the I. And Tracy said something, I mean, what it was just a few seconds ago in the intro, that um, I was thinking about the poem or, you know, I think maybe it should be read with an I, you know, I, uh, and it's kind of the same or the or being a, or an escape route away from the I. So I think me, me as an artist, it's, it's, you know, the whole creative, the whole joy of the creative process is um, uh, honestly kind of running from and towards self at the same time, you know, to, to make it as elusive. I like the radio um, channel, clear and not clear. 
thing coming in. But I also like to, you know, to um, get the behind me, me, so to speak, and which is impossible, you know, but it's, wor it's noble, worthy, you can, can, you know, make passion or something, I don't know. Um, what, what you just said reminded me a little bit of something that you said uh, when you were at the podium um, about rejecting or making fun of those long lines, the frost mm -hmm. lines that um, used to be beautiful and very important to you. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the moment at which the shift became um, defined in those terms for you? And um, also I'm curious because your, your poems have become uh, much more aural and the, the performance of them is something that's, that's so important now. Um, and that has not always been the case. So can you talk a little bit about that? When Tracy says that has not always been the case, she's referring to a time in the, I guess during tutelage, I've known her for a while where, you know, when you're learning to make a shoe, or if you're little Michelangelo going shopping on the weekend for a piece of stone with your dad, you, you get a piece of stone, and it's a piece of stone, and maybe you make a nice foot. You know, it's not a foot that's, you know, organic. And I think that when you're learning or you're practicing writing poetry, you're just trying to get the rooms right. Or oh, Derek Walcott used to always say, I had him in class once, he'd always say, just get the light right. You know, he was speaking in terms of painting, you know, as poets. Just get the light right. So I think in trying to get the stanzas, trying to get the rooms right, speaking of George Nelson, right, there's a famous essay by Nelson that talks about this very thing. It's called The Dead End Room. And I, you try not to make, in your formal training, though you're taught to make these flat, fixed, and finished things. You don't mean to make a flat, fixed, and finished thing. You, you mean to make a thing with windows and openness that will allow any type of socialized person to move into and out of or, or find comfort or tension or whatever. And so it was not always the case where my body was involved in my writing. And I think that being a, or learning to absorb or realizing, I don't want to call it maturity because it still all feels like juvenilia, um, and absorbing in a SpongeBob way so much of everything, I'd be damned if I'm going to stand up at such a wonderful podium as that one. I was talking about how much I liked that podium a little while ago. And be still and not allow the poem to move through me in the same way that it moved through me while I was making it or while it was making me. Because we don't, we don't really know which it is, right? I don't. And so it was not always the case that the, what was it, what someone called it, the um, written orature was, was present. And I'm really into right now, or hoping to be open to, you know, Gertrude Stein says, uh, our job is to continue language, but to continue the body being made in language and to continue the alphabet that way. And so I think it, what, I think the point that it happened is that, you know, I began to read my poems out loud when I was making them. I began to not sit down while I was making my poems. I began to allow that motion again to be a part of the creative process so that I could, perhaps, I don't know if it's true, sense and feel more motion, motion in the meaning, motion in the iambic, motion in anything that was happening, the connotation, denotation, irony, punning, whatever was going on. And so I think it seems not still more than meant to. Okay. Um, I don't know what sense um, the other two of you have of where you've been as a poet, where you're conscious of having been and where you're conscious of, of now turning toward, but are, are those concerns that are in the front of your mind that you want to talk about a little bit? Just in terms of... <laughs> um, in terms of line, or what do you mean exactly? It could be formal, it could formal? be uh, subject, or, or are those the kinds of, of shifts and breaks that you're conscious of making, or is your, is your sense of the trajectory of your career different? I think part of it is um, subject related, definitely, because the first book was called Notes from the Divided Country. So that book focused um, historically on a, the period early, the earlier part of the century. So it focused very much on the Japanese occupation of Korea, which um, really, I think, I think the Korean War can't really be understood without 
the contextualization that's provided by the Japanese occupation of Korea, just because it went on for so long. It was 40, um, really 40 years. And because it was so brutal in that it suppressed, um, they suppressed the Korean language, they forced everyone to change their names to Japanese names. Um, there was, obviously property was completely stripped away. And so, and then that, once, once, um, once the Allies won, and um, Japan's occupation of, of Korea ended, it imme immediately, of course, Korea was divided um, into North and South, and it was, um, it was, it was, it was sucked into the maelstrom of the Cold War. And what's interesting is that the U.S., because they didn't really know very much about the history of the Japanese occupation, they basically put into power all the people who had collaborated with the Japanese. Um, because they seemed to be running things and they knew how to manage factories and so forth. And so that created a lot of resentment, obviously. And then the Civil War broke out almost immediately afterwards, only a few years after World War II ended. So anyway, the first book really deals mostly with the first half of the century, I suppose, and the Korean War itself. Um, the manuscript that I'm working on, um, seemingly forever, is focused more on the aftermath of that. Again, just the sheer strangeness of a country that has been unified for hundreds and hundreds of years, all of a sudden having this very artificial line drawn through it for geopolitical reasons, and then having the two regimes um, continue in completely different ways. Um, just last week, um, Kim Jong-il's grandson, Kim Jong-un, was just appointed the next leader of North Korea. And so you have this complete anomaly of the only family business, um, the only communist dictatorship that's also a, a Confucian dynasty. It's, it's very strange. Um, and apparently China, um, in the back channels, is that they were very displeased, of course. But on the other hand, they don't want to um, do anything that will destabilize North Korea, because that would then send a flood of reg refugees over its borders and perhaps threaten their economic growth. So I guess it's mostly subject related, but, um, and the other obviously big change is, is the birth of a child. So um, I, I think in terms of the line, I've, the line has simply been growing in terms of a longer line rather than a shorter line, but I think that's just been organic. There's just been more material to include. Um, and it seems like the line has been getting longer in order to, to include more, more material, embrace more. Um, I'm actually deal, uh, thinking through this question quite a bit right now, because um, I'm also working on a new manuscript, which I've uh, written entirely in prose right now, and I'm trying to convert it to uh, more uh, more conscious line formation. And part of the reason, th the, the subject matter I'm, I'm writing about, uh, very, very inconsequential stuff compared to what Suji was just talking about. I'm talking about uh, suburban experience in uh, the 70s in a suburb outside of Detroit, Michigan, where I grew up. And m most of my work tends not to be very autobiographical, so maybe I feel the, the liberty to just, um, you know, have long lines or have short lines or use prose uh, as a way, uh, prose sections as a way of um, creating uh, time in the text. But um, I'm writing about a, a city uh, called Troy, Michigan, which obviously has epic connotation. So I'm thinking about Troy in relation to Troy and the city on the hill and um, also the concept of the radiant city and um, the ideas of um, or suburban communities that are built uh, with, uh, that are designed to buffer human interaction um, and what the consequences of that are on the psych, uh, on the psyche of a of a you know young person growing up, so in that I feel like I've been challenged in some ways to you know consider the I am, which is something that I 
uh, have not loved, um, except you know, in historic you know historical poetry. I you know I love you know seventeenth eighteenth century poetry, but um, it's generally has not been relevant for the kinds of things that I want to write about. I still don't think the I am is relevant for what I want to do. Jake Adam York has a new book of poems that just came out called Persons Unknown, and in that he has a a poem called Elegy, which is written completely in iambic pentameter. And in the uh, towards the end of the poem, there's a self conscious moment in which he acknowledges the I am as uh, as if a man is uh, kind of staggering with a limp towards the uh, truth that he's trying to express. And in, this, in, in, in that context, he's writing about um, m- men who were lynched, who, uh, who are unknown, basically. So you know, he has this really wonderful moment in which the um, form is actually uh, lending meaning to uh, the Give, giving context for the reason why this needs to be talked about in poetry. And um, I, I don't think I'm there yet, but I think I'm trying to find a place where um, the line has a place, the line helps me to emphasize maybe the epicness of a small experience or you know a personal experience. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a different kind of gesture, so. Um, before I ask what questions you might have for the poets, I want to ask one, one more question, and that is, can you talk, each of you, a little bit about your experiences working in these other genres or media, and um, what you have taken to, um, in, from poetry to that place, and how coming back to, to the writing of your own personal poems, um, has been affected by working. And, and Thomas, you can, um, yeah, photography, but also I know that music is a big part of, of your life and um, your work, so maybe that can also be part of what you talk about. Um, my new book has photographs in it as well. And I love the Sontag quote, photography is not seeing, it's a way of seeing. I find that um, taking photographs, um, I tend to still shoot in film, medium format and regular format. Um, a little like a camera that I walk around with, of course. And I, um, I find that with the line and with the stanza, that way of seeing has sort of opened up the writing for like um, the possibilities, the way in which I'm going to guide the, the reader through. You know, It's not always so linear now and before, before the photography, the line. Um, which I like to think of as the way William Stafford thinks of it, as a breathing walk. The walk always seems so linear, break, across, break, across, break. And I think because of photography, you know, I've taught myself, I've been unlearned, I've been retrained to enter that, that room in many places, chimney, um, little doggy door, bedroom door, any kind of way. And it's not always so um, the or I or a uh, or even pronoun. Because usually... I, the part of speech often determines the type of stanza you're going to have and how you're going to breathe and walk through the stanza, the part of speech, you, the word you begin with in most cases. So I think that the photography has taught me in that way, like, you know, to put the camera on the ground or put the, put the part of speech entering the line on the ground. And so the perspective or the power or even the, the weakness is just different and so that the, the work isn't all the same. And I grew up a drummer. So I'm always, in, I grew up a drummer who wanted to be a football player. So all of my, it's just always been sort of motion and movement, you know, and, and the poems, especially in this book, um, percussive behavior. You know, I think I, when I look back at this book, you know, already, and I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked by some of the things I actually say, and it's sort of the type of hitting and banging of the critique to get a sound, and even the sort of consonants that go together in the lines. So I'm, I'm a very much um, drumming and running in the work, and I think that's what that prosody, that prose and song is like. I'm okay with it because it's not so much like the first book. So wow, what now, you know, kind of thing. But um, um, I'm, I'm an eyes first kind of person probably, which I probably think is also a trap.
Um, I think that I, I've always had a strong relationship with music. And um, in more recent years of visual art, I taught at uh, the Rhode Island School of Design for six years and spent a lot of time rethinking the writing practice as a studio practice. Um, and by that I mean a practice by which uh, th the work is done, what work is done it is not necessarily about the residue of what work is left behind, but about, it's more about the act of doing it and how the act of doing it changes uh, your perception of the world. So it's, um, my writing classes tend not to be about what poems you've written, but more about what your poems are doing, what, where your poems are taking you in, in conversation, in communion, um, and in geography. And um, a lot of that came to me from working with sculptors and architects who you know, can't forget that they're in space. Um, and I guess musicians don't forget that they're in space either. I think maybe as a poet, I tended to forget that I was in space when I started writing. You know, it was just what could I transcribe from my head to the page and, you know, put a little twist on it. <laughs> um, so um, I feel like my work now, maybe more so than trying to emulate what another art is doing, is trying to create an experience of uh, transforming perception. Um, w whether it be spatially or sonically. And, um, yeah, does that work? Yeah. <laughs> I guess in terms of other genres, um, obviously I, as I mentioned before, I was a playwright first, so um, I have always thought of writing in multiple voices. And, um, and it was a, a great shock to come to poetry where I guess, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's true of the people here, the poets here, thankfully, but there, there are an awful lot of poems that are written in the autobiographical eye. Um, and that was a, a great surprise to me because, you know, it's as if you were composing something and you were limited to one instrument, you know, and, and it seems, it seems like a shape, it's like cutting off a limb or something rather than being able to use the entire orchestra, all the different tones, the different timbres, the, the different tempos that you can bring to the same piece of music. Um, you know, the same note played on a banjo is going to sound very different from the same note played on a flute. So it, it just seemed practical <laughs> um, to, to be able to give yourself the greatest range um, in terms of the theater. But um, in terms of my own work in the theater, um, the, the plays I've been I wrote were um, actually multimedia, so they also drew on the visual, um, and they were very interested in time because of the multimedia. You know, there would be stage time, and then there would be the live feed that would also be the same time as, or the same tempo as everything going on stage, but then some of the live feeds would be playing in slow motion, so there, um, that time would be different, and there would be also different things on video that were either recordings of things that had happened in the past, and they would be also played at different tempos. So I just really loved that weaving of the different tempos of time. You know, you have the stuff that's sped up, you have stuff that's fast forwarded, you have stuff that's slowed down, and then you have actual mm -hmm. stage time as well. So I really loved the, that sort of interweaving, and I suppose I, you know, endeavored to bring that into the poetry. Um, and then just in terms of music, um, I, I guess we all have a strong connection to music. Um, I spent most of my, I guess, high school and college years playing piano and doing some singing, as Derek could tell you. And I think that in terms of what that gives poetry is that there's a famous quote from Mallarmé where he talks about how um, using music and poetry, it's a, it's a wonderful way of resolving an argument without ever stating its terms. Um, it, it's, you know, you, we can, I'd love for us to argue about that one, but yeah. <laughs> But it, it, but it is interesting to at least think about it. And, um, but in terms of you know, specific examples, I always really love the, the Wordsworth poem and also the Langston Hughes poem. I'll, I'll quote them both. So the Wordsworth, um, a slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not 
she seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of, of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force, she neither hears nor sees, rolled round in earth's diurnal round with rocks and stones and trees. And, um, you know, there you can hear this incredibly regular and comforting and incredibly soothing rhythm. I mean, safety, uh, absolute safety. And yet when you look at the subject matter, it's about a little girl who's, you know, basically been buried and is being returned back to brute matter, you know, rocks and stones and trees where the human has become completely inhuman. And so I love how music can really sort of torque those two things against each other. Um, and then in the Langston Hughes poem I always think about is um, Luck, where he says, how does it start? Um, to sometimes, sometimes from the tables of joy, sometimes a crumb falls from the tables of joy, sometimes a bone is flung. To some people, love is given, to others, only heaven. And for me, the music of that, um, you know, again, it's this wonderful, very soothing rhythm. And the rhythm for me, this mu that musical rhythm is, very, is safety. But what he's, but then you look at the actual words, and he's talking about, you know, some people will never be loved, um, and they have to wait for heaven. And again, the, the regularity of that, the only heaven, um, really, to me, is so powerful because it makes you think that heaven is poor and small compared to human love. And I think that that's an amazing insight that he can he uses through through music through musical um, means. Are there, um, I guess we have time for a, a couple of questions at, at least from those of you who might have them. Extremely. Oh, sorry. Uh, in reference to what you spoke about before and the. Uh, extremely cool way you, you perform with your poems. I was wondering, you obviously advertise your poems and then you can't be present in the room while a certain person is reading your poems all by himself. So do you find it hard sometimes thinking about the fact that your poems will not be performed in the mind of the reader like you wish them to be performed? Because obviously it's very different when it's not like that. No way, I couldn't even perform them that way again. Um, it's a, it leaves me and it goes where it goes and you eat your meal. No, I don't, there's no, I don't, I don't read that way because that's the way it's supposed to be. It's just like diving off a springboard. You know, you get your bounce, your bounce, or, or those little kids on the street who do double dutch, trying to get in the rope. Just go in and make mistakes and have some fun, funny thing happen, and they'll take you somewhere else. I don't want it to be a rule book. You know, it's too bad it's there and it's done. You know, because when I was making it, it was open and flying through the universe. Now it's on a page, so no, I don't care. It'd be great to hear it, you know, like remember Michael Jackson died, they were showing all those videos of people all over the world doing those different thrillers and beat it, you know, and I was like, wow, they all had their different, you know, body translate. I mean, I just take it and mess it up. No, I don't care about that. There's no way. Mm -mm. Hi. Um, you opened by asking that question to the panel about uh, uh, identity being especially important to work out for a writer of non-European uh, descent. And it got me thinking that I am, um, not that this cer certainly isn't about me, but it got me to thinking that I am a community college teacher in Camden, New Jersey. And as you may know, that's an almost exclusively non-European descent crowd. And I am pretty self-evidently European descent. I mean, even by the standard of Institute of Advanced Study, I'm pretty uh, <laughs> European descent. And um, it gives, it, like when we are performing the sheet music of the literature together in class, it gives the our mutual presence in discussing something like Othello or even the Greeks' attitudes towards barbarians, it's complete, it gives a completely different quality to our experience that we're both there and we share a similar relationship with one another. And I couldn't help but think, uh, especially when Mr. Ellis was uh, performing the one poem, Reparations, and there was the, you said you did get your body into it. You did get, and like pointing at this crowd saying like, you owe me, 
takes on a completely different meaning when it's performed here and now with these people. And I'm wondering if you are all, or when you are writing about North Korea, you know that we all have a knowledge of, of that place and we experience it together when you evoke it. And I'm wondering, I know you're all very conscious of the musical properties of your words, but I'm wondering how conscious you are when you write of the experience of the performance and the people who are there and how that plays in, if you're conscious of us being here together. Can I start? I, I don't know, know if the question was really directed at me, but I want to start by first saying I, I felt a little flippant with the wording of my question, my first question, because I, I wanted to suggest that the idea of identity often comes to mind when we're presented with poets who are of color or of, of other you know, national backgrounds. Or, um, but I think that's kind of a fallacy. I think that identity is always in play, um, and we don't always get to it first in other contexts. Um, so uh, one of the things that really fascinates me is thinking about, um, and I'll be quick because I want to hear what other people have to say, thinking about a poem that may have to do, you know, a lot of my work has to do with identity as it pertains to America and Americans, and I know that's a broad categorization. Um, but what excites me, let alone um, my awareness of who the reader may or may not be, is when I can find a way of, of unsettling my own sense of who the you and the I or the we and the them um, happen to be in a poem. When I fall down somehow on the, the wrong side of that, that equation, um, or if I'm implicated by um, an act or, or a perception that I don't necessarily agree with, um, when the writing can take me to a space that's that's a little bit uh, more complicated than, than um, what the initial glance might establish in the mind. But um, I'll let these other poets respond. I've forgotten now. I don't know what to say. When I, I don't know. I mean, the thing about this book is that um, I know that I'm writing from a week. For instance, the day of Barack Obama's inauguration. You guys remember that day. I don't know how many people went, but I went because I grew up in Washington, D.C. and got up early and drove down. It was freezing. And I'm the kind of poet. I'm listening to you know, the community, what people are saying, what they're saying afterwards, what they're saying in the cafes. And I mean, there are people who were jubilant, who were shocked, people who um, were pissed, people who people who have an investment in certain types of blackness and and um, grassroots movements who just who are like, oh, it had to be this type of blackness. There's so many ways to, dis to discuss it. So when you become a we in a poem, you know, certainly it's, you know, we talk about the line, there's certain kind of fragmentation that happens with the, the formation of an idea. Now, when I, it's, to me, it's great that the alphabet provides or offers an A-E-I-O-U or an A-E-U-O-Me so that one can arrange, rearrange, um, speak, speak it from many selves, you know, many, M-A-N-Y, which is what happens in that. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that um, there's something else, there's another viewpoint, there's someone else holding a camera, there's, there's another gaze when I speak a A-E-I-O-U or vice versa because, but it's, it's not meant to, I'm glad Suji brought up Langston Hughes, it's not meant to be exact, it's meant to worry the subject area, to worry the conversation, like Langston Hughes has a term called worryation. The poem doesn't have to be so on the subject, just in the area of the rubbing and scratching of it so that it's, there's enough happening that we can all feel some of it. And so I always wanna just make an impression, you know, you know that, that thing that stays for a little while and then goes away. And so you kind of feel, and that's it. I don't, you know, I don't think art, you know, I don't, I don't want that to happen. But I'm very cognizant of it. And it's not an easy thing to stand up there and look into the audience and say, A-E-I-O-U, you owe me, or whatever that belief could be or is. You know, that's not, but the language makes it also. I guess in the same way that identity is fluid and, and constantly changing, same with any given community at any given time. I mean, even this this room, you were talking about space before. I mean, we didn't know who was going to be here before we walked in. And this is a, a community that it will never repeat itself again, you know, this, this gathering of time and space and all these people in this room. And so um, on the one hand, one can 
imagine what a particular audience might be for a particular poem. And on the other hand, it's always going to change. So um, we're in the state, the same state of not knowing as, um, as I, I think we'd know, we, we sort of are as uncertain as we are certain in, of that, in that respect. Um, and when it comes to North Korea in particular, um, I think that actually we're all in the same um, state of not knowing enough about that country. And it's obviously their agenda <laughs> to keep it that way. Um, and so that is also very interesting for me um, in terms of what uh, the varying degrees of knowledge that people might bring to um, hearing a particular poem about North Korea.